Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India positive psychology. Our next topic is positive emotional states and processes. Positive emotional states and processes are very important for us. As you know, thoughts, emotion and behavior, these are three main points or main topics which we discuss in psychology as well as in positive psychology. So, thoughts, emotion and behavior, they influence each other as well as being influenced by each other. And that is why what kind of events we have in our life and what are our understanding or our thoughts about these certain events that is very important because they are triggering our special type of or specific type of emotions. For example, a particular situation if we observe the situation as a happy event we would be having mostly happy thoughts and these happy thoughts trigger our positive emotions. On the other hand, if we perceive certain situation as a stressor situation or maybe you know having something negativity, so that is why it would trigger our negative thoughts, maybe worry or remembering negative emotions and all and such kind of situation, stressful situation, tensionful situation, anxiety provoking situation, all those situations after coming in our thoughts, similar kind of emotions they will trigger in our behavior. It means scientific research tell us that positivity is very important and that is why scholars have focused on positivity. Scientific research tell us that positivity does not simply reflect success and health. It can also produce success and health. So, it is not only it is associated with our success and health, but positivity or positive emotions these are even producing success in our life having a, you know a positive health in terms of physical as well as psychological health. So, positivity spells the difference between whether you languishing or flourishing in your life. So, it means positive emotions are very important and this positivity or positive emotions or positive affectivity these are connected with our well being also. So, if we have positivity in our life then we are flourishing in our life. On the other hand, if we have lack of positivity in our life, then we may suffer, we may have languishing state of mind. So, that is why knowing about emotional states and processes very important and being positive psychology course, here our more focus would be on positive aspects of emotional reactions. Let us understand first emotion. There are various components of emotions. When we talk about different components, these components are cognitions, biology, behavior, social cultural factors, etcetera. When we say cognitive factors or cognition is important to understand emotional reactions, then there is some factors like balance of positive negative emotions that is very important to know to understand emotions, meaningful situations, time. On the other hand, when we talk about biological factors, then uh, biological factors are again very important like neurotransmitters, hormonal changes in our body. So, what kind of chemicals we have in our body, it has impact on our emotional reactions. So, that is why biological factors like certain kind of neurotransmitters, hormonal changes as well as genetic factors are very important to understand emotions. Third component is behavior. When we say behavior, it means self-regulation, our character and virtues and other positive or negative personality traits which are very important to understand our emotions. So, these are the behavioral aspects which have certain impact on our emotional reactions. Fourth component is social cultural factors, social norms, social setting, 
cultural factors, these are also very important to learn emotional reactions because during developmental stages we learn such kind of uh, behaviors and that is why we have cultural differences. So, certain emotional reactions may be more important and may be more highlighted in the particular social settings or socio-cultural settings as compared to other settings. So, that is why culture wise also we try to understand emotional reactions. So, it means consequently our emotions results from a complex interplay of biological, cognitive, behavioral and socio-cultural processes. So, for understanding emotional reactions, cognition, biological, behavioral and socio-cultural components are very important. For understanding emotions, there are various uh, subcomponents or certain ways to define emotions. Let us take one by one to understand emotion as well as positive emotions in detail. First component is positive affectivity. Positive affectivity means is a trait reflects stable individual differences. So, positive affectivity is counted as a trait. Whenever we are saying a trait, it means we are considering that this is stable behavior in our personality. So, to some extent when we say uh, personality traits or uh, maybe uh, you know affectivity or temperament traits, then we are saying that we are focusing more on the stable patterns in our behavior. So, positive affectivity is a trait that reflects stable individual differences in positive emotional experiences. There are various positive affectivities or uh, maybe traits as per positive affectivity. For example, cheerful, enthusiasm, energetic, confident, alert, happiness, excitement, vigor and confidence and like that there could be various positive affectivity traits. Mihil proposed that individual differences in hedonic capacity were present at were partly heritable. So, they are saying that these are stable patterns in our behavior, such kind of traits are stable patterns in our behavior and these are mainly contributed by hereditical factors. Let us know how hereditical factors are important for us. They are saying that there is temporal stability in our behavior as well as we have cross situational consistency. So, first to know how these traits are stable patterns in our behavior, let us understand certain studies on temporal stability and cross situational consistency. This study says that considerable evidence suggests that personality continues to develop and evolve throughout the 20s. Accordingly, stability estimates are significantly lower period to age 30. So, it means they are saying that during developing stages, we do not have stable personality, but at particular stage, at the stage of 30 years, we have stability in our personality and further study highlighting this portion. Studies on older adults have yielded impressive level of stability that correlation level was 0.6 to 0.8 range even across extremely long time spans. It means after 30 stability level is quite high as this study showing that 0.6 to 0.8 range correlations they observed in this study. It means at the age of say 35 positive affectivity is studied and then again at the age of 40 and then these study saying that time 1 that is at the level of 35 years age and time 2 that is at the age of 40 years old age and these studies saying that there is chances to get quite stable patterns and high level of correlation between the behavior of this person at the age of 35 and then at the age of 40. So, this study supporting that temporal stability. When we say temporal stability, it means that is our natural nature and as per this nature, we have certain type of behavior and that is consistent in our behavior. So, to some extent, it is supporting our nature or individual's nature to understand positive affectivity. There are various causes and correlates of positive affectivity. Actually, they try to understand what is role of heredity, what is role of environmental factors, what is role of their interaction. And through these studies, they are saying that whether we have 
stable patterns in our behavior or we can change situation to situation our behavior. So, to know causes and correlates of positive affectivity, let us first understand ways to study the role of heredity and environmental factors. There are various ways to study role of uh, heredity and environmental factors. For example, the classical twin study involved the comparison of monozygotic and dizygotic twins reared together. You must be knowing that a difference between monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins. Monozygotic twins who share 100 percent of their genes, it means that is one egg and divided in two. On the other hand, dizygotic twins who share 50 percent of their genetic material like uh, other siblings. But when we compare monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins, then dizygotic twins like monozygotic twins have uh, similar environment before birth as well as after birth. So, this uh, justification help us to compare monozygotic twins with dizygotic twins rather with other siblings. It means to study heritability we compare monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Sometime we take help of adoption studies and adoption study involves determining the degree to which adopted individuals resemble both their biological relatives or parents which indicate a genetic influence as well as their adoptive relatives or parents an indication of shared environmental influences. It means when we study resemblance of these participants with biological relatives and parents then this resemblance reflect in terms of genetic influences. On the other hand, when we compare them with adoptive relatives or parents, then it indicates shared environmental influences. Because participants were staying with these adoptive relatives and parents, that is why they have resemblance or similarity with their behavior. If this resemblance is with biological relatives and parents, then that is genetic influences. So, that way we try to know what is the role of genetic factors, what is the role of environmental factors and how these are uh, revealed their importance. Let us know how these combinations work and what do we get through different combinations study. For example, when we have correlation between monozygotic twins who reared together. So, in this case they have 100 percent shared of uh, genes as well as shared environment. So, in this situation we expect perfect one correlation. However, it has been observed that in some of these studies that is not perfect one. It is maybe 0 0.9, 0 0.85, 0 0.87 or something lower than uh, 1. So, in that situation we define this rest of the you know percentage or uh, uncorrelated variance that is because of unshared environment. And we assume even in shared environment they have certain things which are not being shared here and that is why they have unshared environment impact. Second situation could be correlation between monozygotic twins reared apart. So, in this case they have 100 percent similarity of uh, genetic uh, components, but role of unshared environment is there. And that is why we could count you know correlation in terms of uh, genes, but uh, the correlation which we could not get that is because of different environmental factors. Third combination may be correlation between monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins rear together. So, role of genetic factors we could easily reveal because they were staying in the same environment both pairs, but monozygotic twins share their percentage of variance 100 percent and dizygotic twins only 50 percent. So, this change tell us a role of genetic factors. Correlation of adopted individuals studies again help us to tell you know correlation with biological parents as well as with adopted parents. Adopted parents correlation tell us shared environmental factors on the other hand correlation with biological parents tell us a role of genetical factors. So, this is the way to understand role of heredity and environmental factors as well as certain interactions and we reveal heritability through some statistical technique. So, let us understand now what are the genetic evidence about 
positive affectivity. Role of multiple genes, environmental factors and their, their interaction we have that is easily you know now we can understand. So what studies are saying about it? Uh, researchers using the scale and then they observed they reported heritability estimates in the range of 0.4 to 0.5. So they had uh, you know psychological test that is multi dimensional personality questionnaire well being scale and in this scale they observed that heritability estimates are 0.4 to 0.5. So to some extent we can say 50 percent role of hereditical factors as per this study. Similarly another study suggested that up to 80 percent of the long term sense of well being is due to heredity. So, again you could say they are just giving 20 percent scope uh, for environmental factors and uh, other factors. Emotional factors are very important for us to understand uh, you know well being because in happiness chapter you will find that positive emotions is very important factor to uh, you know contribute to the well being. When we are saying that well being study is showing such kind of results, it means we are assuming that emotional factors are involved in these studies. It has been observed that temperamental factors have more heritability as compared to other personality factors. So that is why genetic evidence are quite strong to understand positive affectivity. Uh, then there are some studies showing that positive emotionality has different variability, negative emotionality has different variability. That is again very interesting to know that uh, positive emotionality and negative emotionality has different results. For example, Taliesin et al in 1988 found in their study of twins that 40 percent of variability among people in positive emotionality, 55 percent of variability in negative emotionality and 48 of the variability in overall well being stems from uh, genetics. So it means this study showing that positive emotionality and negative emotionality have different results. They also found that shared family environment or learning accounts for only 20 2 percent of positive emotionality and an extremely small 2 percent of negative emotionality. So it means a negative as well as positive emotionality they have different results in terms of family environment uh, factors in terms of genetic factors that is really interesting factors for us. Now next study which is uh, you know interesting one and can say summary of previous researches. So in this study they had various combinations and I think now you can easily understand as per this combination what does it mean. For example identical twins rear together. So we expect highest correlation here because same genes and same environmental factors they have or shared environment they had. Second combination is identical twins reared apart. So uh, they have 100 percent sharing of their genes but uh, environment is unshared. Fraternal twins reared together. So 50 percent genes and but environmental factors are shared in this case. Fraternal twins reared apart. So 50 percent uh, you know genetic uh, differences as well as they are staying in different environment. So by considering all such kind of factors then we are talking about what kind of correlations they have and we estimate even heritability. Through this process we know role of heredity, role of environmental factors, unshared environment influence, shared you know environment influence, heritability and this is the way to know role of heredity environmental factor as well as in some studies we study interactions also. Now next point is another way to handle you know physiological reasons of positive affectivity. So neurobiological basis of positive affectivity. Let us know what are the neurobiological uh, factors for positive affectivity. It has been observed that happy individuals tend to show relatively greater resting activity in the left prefrontal cortex than the right prefrontal area. So it means particular part in our brain is active when we are happier. 
on the other hand another study showing that diasporic diasporic means an emotional state uh, characterized by anxiety depression or unease so it means whenever we have uh, you know abundance of negative emotions we can say individuals display relatively greater right anterior activity opposite to euphoria state of joy or bliss so they are saying that in particular state of mind or in particular emotional reactions you have particular activation in your brain so it means study showing that particular parts are related to our emotional reactions whether these are positive or these are negative so accordingly we have different areas which are getting stimulated during our such kind of behavior now next point is the biology of emotions and in this case we try to understand neurotransmitters and the chemicals of pleasure which neurotransmitters or which chemical secretions in our brain we have when we are happy empirical evidence indicates that at least some of our pleasure responses are caused by the release of certain chemicals in the brain called neurotransmitters neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that relay information between nerve cells and these neurotransmitters are different in different state of uh, emotional reactions scholar have identified various neurotransmitters which are uh, special for uh, our happiness for our positive emotions for our negative emotions etc for example increased level of the neurotransmitters dopamine has been implicated in the experience of happiness so when we have uh, uh, increased level of dopamine then we experience more happiness so to some extent we are saying that there are some juices or some chemical reactions in our brain when we have those type of chemical reactions then we have particular type of mood maybe in some cases these uh, neurotransmitters like dopamine which is helping us to have higher level of happiness or experiencing happiness similarly there are some other neurotransmitters which are actually triggering our negative emotions and some others triggering our positive emotions so that is uh, very important to understand such kind of studies to know what are the biological or neurological basis of our happiness and positive affectivity depu and his associates in 1994 found that various measures of dopaminergic activity were strongly correlated with individual differences in positive affectivity but were unrelated to negative affectivity uh this activity means initiated by the transmitters activity of dopamine or related substances so they are saying that it means there are some particular neurotransmitters which are connected with positive affectivity only but not related to negative affectivity mehil in 1975 focused on certain cerebral joy juices cerebral joy juices means secretion of some special chemicals or neurotransmitters in our uh, brain and that's why we feel happier as compared to others similarly there are some other studies showing the role of neurotransmitters in the mid 1970s a team of researchers discovered that a variety of endomorphins appear to increase pleasure and decrease the experience of pain and this particular neurotransmitters helpful and its you know secretion is very important for us because it act as natural pain killers and this is also helping us to experience pleasure and reduce or decrease the experience of pain endorphin level also increase to as much as 200% during sexual activities so there are certain activities a uh, natural activities through which it may be increased recently a considerable amount of attention has been given to the effects of the hormonal oxytocin or the love hormones so nowadays scholars are taking interest in hormonal changes as well as in neurotransmitters changes in our body or uh, can say broadly chemical changes in our body and how these chemical changes are triggering our positive or negative affectivity so that is main interest of scholars and lots of work is going on in this area however does this mean that 
positive motions such as joy and love are simply patterns of neurotransmitters and hormonal activity? If it is so, then could we say I am not really happy, it is just a chemical imbalance. If it is so, then uh, we are saying that it is uh, you know due to biological factors or uh, some uh, you know physiological factors and we cannot do much, but that is not the case. Although our biological processes are certainly part of the equation, science has just begun to explore the various components of our emotional experiences, which I will discuss in next two slides, where we give importance to some intentional activities, importance to yoga, meditation or mindfulness. So, several other activities are there, which may help us to have higher level of well-being. Let us know state of happy brain also. Researcher conducted significant research to determine which parts of the brain are involved in positive emotions and they observed that the left prefrontal cortex is more activated when we are happy. So, that is again uh, you know a sign of happy brain if we have more activation in our left prefrontal cortex then we are more happy. This area of the brain has also been associated with greater ability to recover from negative emotions as well as enhance ability to express negative emotions. So, to some extent we can say this area is very important to have higher level of happiness and this activation or in this area also help us to uh, recover from negative emotions as well as we enhance ability to express negative emotions. So, activation in this area is very important and support positive direction in our behavior. Can we make efforts to change our brain activities? That is very important for us to know because earlier we are saying that there are certain changes in our brain in terms of neurotransmitters, in terms of particular areas activated, in terms of some hormonal changes and these are happening in our brain and that is why we have certain mode on positive affectivity. Now, our next which is very important for us to know, can we have certain intervention programs, can we have certain strategies through which we can change these brain activities. So, can we make efforts to change our brain activities? To know this factor is very, very important for us. In a unique series of studies involving long term Buddhist meditators, Jonathan Davidson found that people can train themselves to increase activation in the left prefrontal cortex of their brains. So, broadly they are saying that by doing meditation, one can easily increase activities in the left prefrontal cortex. They are also talking about neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means our brain can change throughout our lives as a result of our experiences and the term for this new idea is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity means due to certain activities, we may change our brain activities also. So, for example, through yoga, through meditation, through some other intentional activities, even we may have changes in our brain, which is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is supported by this study also. Sex in 2010 mentioned that while it is often true that learning is easier in childhood, Neuroscientists now know that the brain does not stop growing even in our later stages or later years. So, that is very important for us because during developing stages we consider, we assume where there are some changes and our brain also growing. So, we have certain changes, but nowadays scholars are saying that every time we practice an old skill or uh, learn a new one existing neural connections are strengthened and over time neurons create more connections to other neurons. So, it support brain plasticity. These findings support positive effect of yoga, meditation and other intervention strategies. So, that is why we can have certain changes even in our brain and uh, such kind of things are helping us to or supporting the point that not only psychological benefits we have due to yoga, meditation and other intervention strategies, not only physiological uh, changes, but 
So, there are some uh, brain activities which are favorable when we do yoga, meditation and all. And I think this is best contribution from the neuroscientist where they are supporting various intervention strategies which are being promoted in applied positive psychology. Now, next point is after knowing genetic factors role, what is role of demographic and environmental correlates? Studies showing that it is not much. They have studied various you know demographic and environmental correlates like age, gender, marital status, ethnicity, income, socio-economic status, etc. And uh, this study showing that income, educational attainment and socio-economic status each accounted for less than 2 percent of the variance in scores on the MPQ, you know multi-dimensional personality questionnaire well-being scale. So, uh, it means if we compare role of genetic factors as well as demographic and environmental correlates, then we could say genetic factors definitely have higher uh, percentage of variance as compared to demographic and environmental factors. I hope positive effectivity as well as how genetic and environmental factors are contributing to positive affectivity is clear to you. Next topic is positive emotions. In this class being positive psychology course, I am focusing more on positive aspects of emotional component. Positive emotions such as joy, interest, contentment, love, etc. are marker of optimal well-being. In all uh, well-being modules, you will find that positive emotion is very significant variable or very significant factor and it has been discussed a lot in happiness studies. Emotions include subjective experience, facial expressions and physiological changes. When I am saying emotional reactions or emotions, it means you have certain subjective experiences. So, emotional subjective experiences may be related to positive emotions, may be related to negative emotions. Sometimes we observe some facial expressions also as per and some of these expressions are quite clear. On the other hand, some physiological changes also we have as per our emotional reactions and there are various studies in which they have observed that like galvanic skin response, heartbeat, pulse rate and some other physiological indicators also we study when we study emotional reactions. So, emotions include subjective experiences which are our uh, you know personal experiences, facial expressions as well as physiological changes which are captured by various physiological tools and we try to find out what kind of physiological reactions we have as per certain emotional reactions. Now, next point is which is again very important difference between affect and emotions. However, affect and emotions are being uh, used interchangeably in the researches. Still, they are saying that there could be significant difference between affect and emotion. Affect is a person's immediate physiological response to a stimulus and is typically based on underlying sense of arousal that is autonomic arousal level. On the other hand, when we say emotions, these refers to cultural and social expression and uh, in comparison we could say affects focus more on biological and physiological nature. So, this difference could be counted. However, again I am repeating there are various researches where they have uh, used these two terms interchangeably. Next very interesting concept is independence of positive and negative emotions. Before showing independence of these two, they are focusing on how do we consider connections or association between positive and negative emotions. Another basic theme in positive psychological concerns the relationship between positive emotional states and well-being which is well established, but what about the connections between positive and negative emotions. It is assumed that if a person could eliminate his or her negative emotions, then positive emotions would automatically take their place. There are some assumptions to prove this fact. For example, to win large sum of money in the lottery are driven by this assumption. So, if you have lots of money, then there is no scope to have negative emotions 
and you would not be having worry, anxiety, tension, etc. And uh, you would be happy only because you won the lottery. They assume that positive and negative emotions exist in a dependent relationship such that if negative emotions go down, then positive emotions must go up. Clear cut assumption here is if you have high score on negative emotions, then automatically you would be having low score on positive emotions and vice versa. So, high score on positive emotion, then automatically you would be having low score on negative emotions. However, some studies contradicting this fact. They are saying there is independence between positive and negative effects. For example, you know scholar reviewed several research studies that examined this notion and found that positive and negative emotions are relatively independent. There is no connection which we are assuming as per our previous findings. He discovered that they tend to have distinct causes and can even occur together at the same time. He has given some examples. For example, a mother can easily feel both some degree of sadness and considerably joy at the wedding of her only daughter. So, there are various occasions in our life where we have mixed feelings, mixed emotions, certain reasons of uh, sadness or uh, maybe uh, stress, but others reasons to be happy. So, they are saying that these emotions negative as well as positive are independent and we may have mixed emotions, some from negative emotions, some feelings from positive emotions. Physiological studies have also supported this point and physiological studies have also found that positive and negative emotions are associated with different biological markers. So, if there are different biological markers, it means to some extent they are independent and that is why they may happen independently. Next very interesting point is how often a person feels positive emotions may have very little to do with how often that person feels negative emotions. Very interesting point it is, this means that efforts to increase positive emotions will not automatically result in decrease negative emotions, nor will decrease negative emotions necessarily result in increased positive emotions. It does not mean when you have increment in positive emotions, automatically your negative emotions would decrease or when you have abundance or higher level in your negative emotions, automatically your negative emotions would decrease. Again, I am repeating this statement because this statement is very, very important to understand next studies. This means that efforts to increase positive emotions will not automatically result in decrease negative emotions nor will decreased negative emotions necessarily result in increased positive emotions. So, it means when we are increasing positive emotions, it does not mean automatically negative emotions would go down or vice versa. This is uh, very important to know and uh, understand how uh, we can have such kind of uh, you know components in our intervention programs. The evidence also suggests that positive and negative emotions are not equal. In other words, negative emotions reduce our level of well-being more than positive emotions increased it. And this is a ratio which I will discuss in the next points, but before that this evidence saying that positive and negative emotions are not equal. So, negative emotions reduce our level of well-being more and positive emotions increase it less. So, positive emotions role to improve our well-being is lesser as compared to negative emotions which are reducing our well-being. This helps to explain why the positivity ratio, the ratio of positive to negative emotions requires for flourishing is 3 to 1. This ratio supporting that at least 3 times positive emotions for flourishing we should have as compared to our negative emotions. So, so this ratio is we need to have 3 times more positive emotions as compared to negative emotions and uh, this is called Losada ratio. They found that when the mean ratio of positive to negative emotions was at or above 2.9, people tended to flourish in their life. So, 3 times positive emotions we need to have 
as compared to negative emotions to flourish in our life. That is why abundance or high level on positive emotion is very important for us to have in our flourishing life. There are various type of emotions. Some of them are quite common or can say basic emotions. On the other hand, there are some others which are quite complicated and uh, that is why we have a series of or number of primary as well as secondary emotions. Now after knowing positive emotions, let us know a theory which is a quite famous theory in positive psychology by Barbara and uh, her associates the broaden and build theory of positive emotions. A, through this theory, you will find that how do we have broaden and build style and uh, it is contributing positively to our life. So, how positive emotions uh, you know broaden and build uh, our lifestyle in positive direction that is main point here. It describes positive emotions in terms of broaden thoughts, action repertoires and describe their function in term of building enduring personal resources. So, basically this theory is saying that when we are with positive emotions, when we have abundance of positive emotions, then it is broadened thought and action processes and these processes actually uh, develop our personal resources which help us to have higher level of positive emotions. The first central claim of the broaden and build theory is that experience of positive emotions broaden a personal momentary thought action repertoire. That is this theory's first claim. It means positive emotions lead to positive thoughts and positive actions. So, let us know why positive emotions are an essential topic within the science of well-being because they actually helping us in various positive directions and that is why positive emotions are very important for us. Barbara and her associates mentioned that positive emotions are essential because they produce health, well-being and fuel human flourishing. So, these emotions are for our human flourishing. Second is broaden people's attention and thinking. So, we have a broader or a higher level of attention and thinking when we are with positive emotions. We build resilience when we are with positive emotions. Build consequent personal resources when we are with positive emotions. Trigger upward spiral towards greater well-being in the future. So, we have higher level of well-being. So, it is just like spiral going upside when we are with positive emotions and this spiral will be discussed in next slide. The broaden and build theory conveys how positive emotions move people forward and lift them to the higher ground of optimal well-being. So, the building hypothesis is the second central claim of the broaden and build theory is that experiences of positive emotions build people's enduring personal resources which I discussed in the last slide. Correlational and experimental studies provide indirect evidence that positive traits, states and behavior are linked with positive states such as play helps to increase physical, intellectual and social resources. So, whenever we are playing and with the positive emotions we are, then playing state of mind or playing activity help us to increase our physical, intellectual and social resources. So, during play when we are with positive emotions, this activity help us to uh, increase our physical health, our intellectual level as well as social resources we develop during this process. So, uh, what this theory is? Let us know in terms of this model as well as next one so that we can understand a little bit more about this theory which is very interesting and very famous in positive psychology. So, this spiral is like this experience of positive emotions. We are with the state of positive emotions and because of these positive emotions we broaden momentary uh, thought action repertoires. So, we have broader you know mode of our thoughts and actions and because of broader view of our thoughts and actions or can say positive mode of our thoughts and actions, it is actually 
uh, increasing our resources, built enduring personal resources. So, because of positive mode, positive thoughts, positive action, we are building enduring personal resources. These personal resources again help us to transform and produce up, upwards spiral. Because we have uh, developed certain resources, that is why we are a little bit more happy now and this spiral going in positive direction, that is why we are experiencing more positive emotions. So, that way it is the, it's the positive spiral, every day we are growing upside by using positive emotions. Similarly, same model just to give a little bit more insight because this theory is very important for us and we should learn what does it mean. First of all, positive emotions, positive emotions broadening the situation and that is why we have novel thoughts, activities as well as in positive emotions, we are in positive mode that is why we are strengthening our relationships. And because of this building enduring personal resources, resources may be in terms of social support, building resilience, skills, knowledge and all these personal resources building style helping us to have better health, better survival, better fulfillment. And this way this is actually again produces more experience of positive emotions creating an upward spiral. So, similarly you know it is again increasing our positive emotions. Actually this model is just opposite to the model for depression in which we have uh, you know this spiral downside and every day because of depression we are going uh, you know in a, a higher level of depression. And just opposite to this when we are with the positive emotions every day we are growing and adding some strengths in our personality and uh, which is helping uh, you know in terms of our health, our quality of life, happiness and all those things. And that is why because of this happy and healthy mode or uh, abundance of positive emotions we have, this is actually increasing our positive emotions and this way it is contributing in positive direction. And uh, there are some intervention programs, strategies through which they want to develop such kind of positive emotions which are contributing in positive uh, sense or in positive direction in uh, different components of our life. Next topic is culture and emotions because understanding emotions in terms of culture is very important. People from all over the world have the same emotions no matter where they are from people feel happy, sad, surprised, angry and distinguished. However, the same events do not always bring out the same emotions. So, certain events in different situations, different cultures, different countries, different uh, societies may be observed or may be perceived differently by people. Uh, when we talk about the cultures, broadly we study two basic cultures only, individualistic cultures and collectivistic cultures. Individualistic culture as well as collectivistic cultures responses on emotions are different. For example, it has been observed that people feel comfortable revealing their feeling to others who are close to them and it happens in individualistic cultures like United States and Canada. On the other hand, in collectivistic cultures, it has been observed that disgrace expression of any negative emotions that might upset relationship among people who belong to the in-group like in Japan and India. So, it means we do not share negative emotions with our near and dear because we think this person may be you know unhappy to know about this thing. So, we are not interested to make our near and dear unhappy that is why we do not share or express our negative emotions in collectivistic cultures. So, they observed such kind of responses from collectivistic cultures like Japan and India. 
on the other hand in individualistic culture they are saying that they are comfortable to reveal such kind of feelings in their close relations like uh, this data was from united states and canada so uh, we can say how do we share our emotional reactions differ culture to culture and in terms of individualistic versus collectivistic culture these are significant differences so it is also observed that participants living in individualistic north african countries more often identify happiness with high arousal positive affect and this high arousal positive affect means excitement euphoria enthusiasm so they show high volume positive emotions to show happiness on the other hand low arousal positive affects in eastern asian cultures or in collectivistic culture has been observed like serenity peacefulness calmness and uh, this is second difference between you know individualistic cultures versus collectivistic cultures so broadly we can say in individualistic cultures people feel happy or identify happiness with high arousal positive affect high arousal positive affect means excitement euphoria enthusiasm showing high volume positive emotions on the other hand in uh, collectivistic eastern asian cultures it has been observed that that's more you know serenity peacefulness calmness and feel you know world within or peace and feeling quite calmness uh it supports importance of happiness explanations such as peace of mind inner harmony world within in asian cultures in asian cultures these are the models of happiness not like mainstream or western cultures where they have identified some external factors in asian cultures scholars have focused more on world within peace of mind inner harmony these models will be discussed in happiness classes so that's why that is second difference between collectivistic and individualistic cultures individualistic cultures show high volume positive affect on the other hand collectivistic cultures show low arousal positive affect which are positively correlated with happiness and that's why asian scholars focus more on peace of mind inner harmony world within to understand happiness thank you very much i'll keep this topic continue in the next class